Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Special guest today, he is a FCS college football champion with the Sam Houston Bearcats, that is my school, and he's a current tight end coach of the Southeastern Oklahoma State University. Give it up for Mr. Dalton Meyer. How are you doing today, sir? How are you doing? I'm great. We just uh, we finished practice today. We have a we have a big game coming up uh, this Saturday against Arkansas Monticello. So I'm excited for that. I'm excited to be on the show and and just fired up to be here. Thank you for having me. Hey man, it's my pleasure. You know, I have a lot to ask. You are you know former Sam Houston State alumni, and me, I love Sam Houston State so much. And I see the Sam Houston Bearcats. I see those jerseys in the back. So definitely we're repping. But you know, before we get to your days at Sam Houston. Um, you know, obviously, you've gotten pretty far in your football career. I'm just curious, where did your love of football come from? Yeah, so it started when I was little. Uh, I don't remember the time exactly. My dad, my dad used to love football, and we always watched it with him. And I'll never forget, it was the Super Bowl. It was the Giants and the Patriots when, when Tyree caught it on his helmet. Wow. We were watching yeah. that game. And at that moment, I asked him, hey, what's your favorite football team? And Whatever team he would have said there would have been my team forever. And he ended up saying the Green Bay Packers. And so that ended up becoming my team. And so ever since then, uh, I fell in love with football. And then I started playing in fourth grade. Uh, I know my parents, they didn't want me to play football for a little bit. They wanted me to start with flag. So I started playing flag football. But I moved to Texas in fourth grade. And, you know, as you know, football in Texas is pretty big. And so I kind of yeah. had no choice. I fell right into it. And I started playing in fourth grade. And from then on, it's just something that I've been in love with since. Man, that's dope. And that's a great game to start off. Uh, the oh, Patriots man. and the Giants. That's a great – that's one of the best Super Bowls <laughs> of all time. So that's an excellent way. That's a great answer. Um, did you – was there any other sports that competed with football? Or was football the only love for you? Yeah, I, I played everything when I was little. I started with tennis, actually. Tennis was one of my big sports. Um, but the sport that competed with football the most was baseball. Uh, I loved baseball. It was something that I played for, for a long time. I was a catcher and first baseman. And uh, when I got to high school, I wanted to do both. I wanted to play football and baseball. But, you know, I, I moved to Texas. So I moved to Texas in fourth grade and went back to California. And then in high school, I moved back to Texas. And I tried out for the Texas uh, high school team. I went to Alvin High School. And I just couldn't compete. I was trying to throw it down the second from catcher. And I couldn't make it. I was like, man, I just don't think I don't think I got it for baseball. And so it really stuck with football. I knew I wanted to play football the whole time, but baseball was close. But at the end of the day, I, I knew that at, at the end of the day, I was going to play football. Gotcha. So, yeah, football, that was the main sport that you had the dreams in. I'm curious, did you have NFL dreams when it came to football? Man, I think I think every kid had NFL dreams, uh, you know, I've always wanted to play. I always thought that it would be something that would be really cool. But at a certain point, you just know. Uh, I, I was playing tight end at 6'2", which, you know, isn't an ideal height. And so in high school, I kind of had the idea, well, look, I, I'm not going to make it to the NFL, but I want to make it to college. Uh, as I grew up, I became more of a college football fan than an NFL fan. And so I loved college football. And so I knew I wanted to play college football. I had NFL dreams, but – just like probably 90% of the people that, that are playing football, you have to come to the realization that, hey, it's not going to happen. And so, you know, my dreams were cut short, but, you know, I'm so happy what I'm doing now. I have no complaints, and I finished off with a great career. So I am definitely have no complaints about how it went down. You know, and the thing about when you say that, yeah, a lot of people I meet, they love college football more than the NFL, and I didn't get that until recently. Sam Houston had a big win against Texas State, and I got really excited. And I was like, I could see the hype of this college because I actually went to that game. I could see the hype of the college football over the NFL. So I could see why yeah, college football is definitely yeah, your thing. Yeah, I think there's just a different – there's a dim, different atmosphere when you're in college football. It just means more. And I know with NIL, it's kind of become maybe a little bit of a money game. But for the longest time, there was no money involved. It was all about playing football, you know, potentially playing your last football and then having those NFL dreams. So just the atmosphere and, and the band and all the fun traditions that colleges yeah. have, the different uniforms, it just really made it, the mascots even, it made it just so much more for me. And that's what made me fall in love with college football. Definitely the bands, man. I, that That's, I love, it. I miss those bands. <laughs> um, speaking of, so college football, so your senior year, you know, 
you say you're a walk on. I, I heard your walk on radio, right? So just tell me what that process was like t- to get to Sam Houston. Like, how did that? How did you get to Sam Houston? Yeah. So my junior year, I started recruiting and going on the recruiting road. And you know, like every other kid that was that was wanting to be a Division One athlete, I was hitting up all the Division One schools and, and sending my film in, sending emails, and just wasn't getting a lot of responses. And and that's the reality you have to face as a person, as a player that. You know, maybe my life isn't going to be playing at Alabama or University of Texas. And I had to come to that realization. But I knew I still wanted to play Division One football. So my senior year, when I got in, when I got into my senior year, I started getting some offers from some Division Three schools, some Division Two schools. And I went to a Sam Houston camp and I competed in it. They, they really liked me. They told me to go to a contact camp. And it was like a it seemed to be a money grab. It was definitely, you know bring some guys, put on some pads and, and say that you have a chance. And I went to that and actually did really well. And at the end of the year, I sent my film in and I actually got a preferred walk-on offer, which if you don't know what preferred walk-on is, you're on the team, but you're not on scholarship. So you don't have to try out like a true walk-on. You just get to be on the team without a scholarship. So I had that PWO and then I had a PWO to Texas State and then a lot of D2s and D3s. And you know, it really came down to Texas State, Sam Houston, and Texas Lutheran uh, Division uh, Three school in Seguin, Texas. And I just knew that I wanted to play Division One football. That was a dream. And Texas State, they already signed two scholarship tight ends. And so I knew that my home was going to be Sam Houston. I took a chance and I decided to, hey, I talked to my mom and said, hey, man, you know, I'm going to make this. I'm going to do this. It, it's going to be tough. We're not going to be on scholarship. We're going to have to pay for school. But I really think it's going to work out. I'm going to put my work in it, into it. And so that's how it started. That's what got me in the door at Sam Houston. Gotcha, man. Hey, you know, funny when you say Sam Houston and Texas State were one of the two options. And like I said, my girlfriend went to Texas State. I'm going to Sam Houston. It's a great thing you picked Sam Houston. That's the right <laughs> option. That's the right you, in Texas State, you know, I've been surprised for a long time why Texas State hasn't been good because the school is amazing. The facilities – they're okay. They, they definitely need improvement. But San Marcos, as a college town, is it, gorgeous. It's such a cool place to play. And so I've always been confused why they haven't been able to recruit. And so it's really cool to see uh, G.J. Kinney. You know, that's a tough one to say. G.J. Kinney. What, what they've been able to do at Texas State has been really cool to watch. But, you know, I, I love Huntsville. It, it's, it'll be my forever home, my, the place I can always go back to and have a lot of great memories. So I definitely can't complain with how it turned out. Gotcha. So you go to Sam Houston. Um, what was your first day like in the program at Sam Houston? Could you walk us through like what was the first day like for you? Well, it's actually funny because I missed our first team meeting as a as a true freshman. I fell asleep. I didn't I didn't wake up in time. Ooh. And being a being a walk on at the time, you know, they didn't even notice that I wasn't there. So I always tell that story. It's pretty funny. They didn't even know I missed. But, you know, it was hard. You go in, and I always tell people my first number on the team was negative 10. Uh, I didn't have a number yet. All the walk-ons, we all had negative numbers. So I walk in. I have a, I have a jacket still that says negative 10 on it. And so you just start from the bottom. And so getting the playbook, being told, hey, you're going to be running with the scout team. That's what, you got to learn the playbook on your own. We'll see you next year. Get in the weight room. And so my first year – and first day was just kind of a, a shock, a culture shock to me. You know, I wasn't a star at Alvin High School at all by any means. I was I was a pretty good tight end, and I did well. But just kind of going from being a well-known uh, and established tight end to now number negative ten. Hey, see you next year. Get in the weight room. It's definitely a it's definitely a change. And you know, I took that seriously, and I got in the weight room and started learning the plays, and had to just kind of figure it out on my own. Wow. Yeah. Negative. Having a negative number, that is a, uh, that definitely hits the ego, huh? Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> so could you walk us through also like the day to day of your life as a, you know, college a student, ath- a student athlete, essentially. Right. Because, you know, a lot of people don't understand the challenges of it. So like, what is like the pros and cons of it? And could you just walk us through your day on a normal basis? Yeah. So regular season day, we would wake up at 5 a.m. We'd have six o'clock practice in the morning. Sam Houston. I know a lot of schools are different, but Sam Houston practice in the morning. So we would practice from about six to ten. 
Uh, for me, it was scout team. So I had to kind of get the looks that the offense, that the opponent's offense was and, and give looks. And, you know, I'm playing against the first team defense every day. So that was something that, you know, I always appreciated because I was playing when we won the national championship. Our team was the number one defense in the nation. So I was getting to go up against the number one defense every day. And so we'd have practice. And then from about 11 to, I would say, two, we had to handle classes. And, and that's kind of the con of being a student athlete is you have to balance practice, meetings, and school. You're still a student at the end of the day. So I had all my classes, my freshman year classes that I had to go through, all the basic learning stuff, the math, your English, your history, um, your American history, of course. And then at night we had meetings. And so I didn't get to watch any of my film because we were watching the, the first team offense. So I'd just be sitting in the meetings, just kind of learning, trying to copy what our starting tight end, his name was Woody Brandom. Uh, he's still a good friend of mine. He's actually a tight end in the UFL. Uh, so I got to watch him and just kind of copy what he did, look at his notes, look what his technique was. And then we'd have maybe a walkthrough at night and then you go to bed and do it all over again. So, you know, it kind of got monotonous. You're going through the same thing every day, getting ready for the game. And then game day hits. And my first year, I was in the stands. I was in the stands watching with my mom. She would come down and, you know, it, it makes you hungry. It makes you hungry as you're sitting in the stands being like, I want to be down there one day. I want to be playing. And so doing that and being on scout team, it, it, it took a while. And then pros and cons. I mean, the pros are the people you meet. Uh, some of my favorite memories – you don't remember the games, you know, I'll always remember the national championship game, but yeah. you don't remember the the week three game or the week four game. You remember being in the locker room after a practice and hanging out with the guys, being in the ice tub and just chatting it up, going to a friend's house and all hanging out. And so that's a pro, you know, we're basically a fraternity without having to pay. Uh, we're, we're a whole group of guys that are just hanging out, doing the same thing, loving the same thing, getting to go out together and have a great time. And so those were the pros. And then the cons, like I said, just having to balance everything all together. You know, you don't get a lot of sleep. You wake up tired. You wake up not wanting to go to work out. You, you dread it. But it, it's what you got to do. You, you signed up for it, and, and that's the life you got to live. Man, that does sound like a grind, though. That sounds like an absolute grind. <laughs> that was every day, huh? So like Saturdays and Sundays as well? Yeah, so Saturday we'd have our game, and so I'd be watching, and then Sunday we're right back to it. We're getting ready for the next game. We're having like a light lift, nice. just kind of getting the body feeling good, and then we're on to the next week. Man, hey, I commend you for that though. That's that's a grind. That does that teaches discipline though. That teaches that teaches a lot for the real world. So I do commend, but that is a, it's definitely not for everyone. Um, I'm curious as well though. Like in your life, obviously you had a good amount of coaches. Um, was there any coach? that stood out to you? It could be in Sam Houston, it could be at Alvin High School. Like, was there any coach that stood out to you that helped shape the man you are today? Yeah, I would probably say Coach Merkins, our tight ends coach at Sam Houston State. Uh, he was, he's a younger guy. He wasn't very, he wasn't that much older than us, but he's been in the business a long time. He's done the trek that, that I'm currently doing now. He was a division two position coach, worked his way up, was an inside receivers coach, and then became a tight ends coach. And he just really, understood us as players because he played at Sam Houston as well. So I've always really appreciated coaches that have played because they understand the grind that we're in and the struggles that we're in. And he really, he was able to talk, he would get on us and, and every coach should, he was able to get on us and challenge us and critique us, but he was also able to talk to us as a friend, as a, as a guy that understood it. And so I really look up to him. He's still one of my great friends. He'll be invited to my wedding eventually. And so it's just play coaches like that. Another coach is Coach Darlington at Incarnate Word, where I ended up transferring my last year. Uh, coach Darlington played center at Oklahoma. So he came from a big time school. And so he understood everything as well. And he just kind of put it, he put the game into a perspective that made it easy to understand and just was able to just teach me things. Even as a coach now, I still take things from Coach Darlington. I'll hit him up every once in a while, ask him questions. So those two guys really influenced me. They'll be my friends for a very long time, and they made my my career a whole lot easier. Wow, that's that's great to hear. Um, did you? Is there any players that you played with that also had a similar impact, maybe in leadership or just how they you know approach the game? Yeah, some of my best friends. My my group has always been offensive line. 
uh, being a blocking tight end, being a 12 personnel tight end. I kind of was around the offensive line the most. And a couple of my best friends, Ben Bankston, Seth Colsheen, and Ethan Hagler, those three guys just epitomize hard work and dedication. Uh, ben Bankston and Seth Colsheen were both walk-ons as well. So those were guys that I could relate to. We were in the struggle together. Ben Bankston was actually one of the first friends I ever made. He, uh, We were in the walk-on lift together, and we were in the same rack, and he was a lot stronger than I was. So I had to sit there and work my butt off and try to keep up with him. And then Ethan Hagler, he's a four-year starter, uh, pre-conference All-American, just an absolute dog. And, and he pushed me to do to, to push past my limit. And we'd always work out together in the off season. And he's just a great guy to be around. And then Seth Colsheen, he's number 69 on Sam Houston right now. This is last year. He was a true walk on. He walked on as a tryout, got a scholarship or not got a scholarship, but got a spot on the team. And he was 60 pounds overweight and he was about weighing at 360. Wow. He dropped all that weight down to 300. And now he was uh, the first game against Rice. He was named captain. He was put on scholarship. Now he's one of the leaders of the team, and and that just shows true tenacity. And to be able to do that, especially being a true walk-on, he's somebody that I looked up to and still do as just a great leader. And he doesn't play. He doesn't play a lot. He's the backup center to Ethan Hagler, who he never leaves a game. And so to be able to do that and be named a captain, that just shows the respect that he's earned on the team. And so he's a guy that I've always appreciated and look up to. Gotcha. Um, and just stay on the player at the player point is the who is the let's say most difficult or the best player that you played against in your time at Sam Houston like a guy that you remember he's on the opposite side of the field he's a guy that you remember the most like yeah he's gonna be he may have made the NFL maybe not but he, you know he's gonna be he or he was special yeah I would say one of the if I had to name a name it would be Isaiah Chambers from McNeese. He ended up, he was a transfer from Houston, goes to McNeese. Uh, he played a couple years in the UFL. He might still be in the UFL or he might be in Canada, but he was just an absolute freak of nature. I mean, he could make plays everywhere that, you know, we even had two guys blocking him, me and my other tight end, Isaac Schley, and he gets right by both of us. And we kind of look back and we're like, man, what, what are we supposed to do about that? And then as a whole D line, I think going up against North Dakota State, I mean, those are just some big dudes. And there's a reason that they've won the national championship so many times and they're such a prestigious school. Those guys were dudes. And just seeing them in warm-ups being like, man, this is going to be a long game. And they were so disciplined and just so smart with the, with how they played. They're not the most athletic. They're not they're, they don't have a single like dog on their team. They're all they're all dogs, but they didn't have like a superstar. They were just all good. And it was something where, like, there was no mismatch. You had to you had to have a perfect game to be able to beat them. And then just playing Sam Houston's D-line, playing against Trace Muscoro, Joe Wallace, Jahari K, Javon Leon, the national championship year and the year before, just having to play against them on scout team, man, just being able to be against the best defense in the nation, it made me such a better player. And, and I had to play scout team O-line a couple times just because we were low on bodies. And so I was a 250 pound center play, playing against Joe Wallace. And that was, that was, as you expect, it was rough. So yeah. <laughs> just all those guys. But if I had to put a, a specific player, I would say Isaiah Chambers from McNeese. I got to look. You say he might be in the UFL. I'm going to have to look into him because yeah, he sounds like, you say freak of nature. He sounds like he's amazing. Yeah. Um, I wanted to speak on that national championship, right? So, yeah, let's go to the 2020-2021 season. You guys win the championship. But before that, let's go before that. Did you guys feel like that the team that you had, like in the preseason and, you know, before the season started, did you feel like this was the team that can go all the way? Well, it was weird because it was COVID. So it was in COVID. Yeah. So the fall gets canceled. And so we're like, shoot, we don't have a season. This is going to be a long, you know, wait till next year. And then all of a sudden the spring season comes about and everyone starts opting in. And then we find out that we're playing. But at the time, excuse me, at the time, we didn't have a field house because we had just tore it down. We were rebuilding our field house. So we didn't have any of that. So we were carrying our pads in our cars. We were doing laundry at our house. Our locker room was the weight room during game day. 
So we were really in the thick of it at that time. We were going through it. And so we had a chip on our shoulder because the the difficulty that we had. And I think after the first game against South, uh, Southeastern Louisiana, we were like, oh, we got a team here. We got a team that can that can make it because they were projected to win. They had a great quarterback in Cole Kelly. He was about 6'6", was hard to stop. People, We had people sacking him. He was still making throws. But we beat him by, I think, 30. And at that point, we were like, okay, you know, we had our chip on our shoulder because of COVID. You know, we were wearing the mask the whole time, couldn't couldn't be around each other, had to be, you know, 10 feet apart or however it was. And so just that whole season, we had that chip on our shoulder with everything we were going through. And then we just started stacking wins. And, and it was like, okay, you know, we have a real chance here. And then we get in the playoffs and we play Monmouth the first round. We win that game. And then we go and have to play North, uh, North Dakota State. And that's where like, okay, this is the real test. This is where we find out if we can do it and we win and we beat them. And then we have James Madison, who was on, who was a great team. They're still great now on the FBS level. They're a team that could potentially be in the playoffs. We go and have to play them. And we were down 24 at halftime. And we're thinking, man, like it was a great season. It was a great run. We did our best. And then all of a sudden we come back and we win that game. And then we go in the national championship against South Dakota state. And so just that whole season, we were always the underdog, always had that chip on our shoulder. And with COVID, no locker room, bringing our pads to practice, it was just it, – it really made the championship so much more special given everything we had to go through. Man, yeah, I was following you guys in the run, and it was it was a very stressful, like, getting to that championship. Because I saw North Dakota, I was like, oh, that's the, that's the big dogs. But, <laughs> you know, we got through that. James Madison. Um, the South Dakota State, that is the national championship game. And – I'm curious, what was the atmosphere like, like the night before and then right before the game? Like those, what, 12 to 20 hours? Like what was the atmosphere of you and the team before that big game happened? Man, it was it was exhausting. It was just so much preparation, so many nerves. We got to save the star in Frisco with the Dallas Cowboys stay. And it was a great experience. It, it was so much fun to be around, and but just exhausting in terms of the mental preparation it takes to get to that game and just the nerves and, and you want to do this. You want to seal off the year we were undefeated. You want to seal off the year undefeated. And it just – it was a lot. But it was so much fun being around the guys and, and being prepared and feeling like we had a good game plan. And then the day of the game, it starts pouring rain. So we're at the game and it's pouring rain. It was it was miserable for a little bit, but just being there, seeing the crowd, South Dakota State, I got I gotta give them props. They travel really well. So their whole side was filled up. You know, we're right next to Frisco, so our side was filled up. Even during COVID, we had full stands. They allowed it to be full stands. And so it was just such a great atmosphere, but the nerves leading up to it were so much. Just because you had such a good season, you want to leave. You want to leave on a high note, and there's just so much that goes into it that it was a lot. And then, you know, thankfully the payoff was there, and we got the win. But those those days leading up to it were were very stressful. For sure, it sounds very stressful. And then you get to the game, and obviously, I guess maybe some people say the stress still exists and the nerves exist, or maybe you know they they're gone because you're in it. But we get to the fourth quarter, and Sam Houston is losing. Final drive, I believe the score is twenty-one seventeen at this point. What is the nerves like for you at this point when this drive's about to happen? Like, what are your nerves right now? Oh man, I I was I was on the sideline, freaking. My head was turned, my eyes were closed. We had a couple fourth downs that I was I was praying and just sitting there. It was so nerve wracking. And we even had a play where Jaquez Ezard, our receiver, fell. He fell down on a fourth down and still caught the ball. And I'm thinking, you know, every fourth down, I'm like, man, here it is. This is this is the one, you know, God, we were so close. And we would get it. And then we would keep driving. It's like, man, another fourth down, here we go. And then we actually, the second the second play before the catch by Ife Dei was mm -hmm. a design play to our tight end, Isaac Schley. It was a corner route. It was a switch route. So the corner goes here, the post goes here. Corner should be wide open. And so I'm thinking, oh, my God, we're about to win with a tight end touchdown. This is going to be crazy. But he gets double covered. The ball doesn't go through. And then finally we get the catch with Ife. 
and just it's one of those feelings that like I'll always remember, but I can't explain it. It's just you hear the crowd, you you kind of go blank for a second. I was on field goal, so I had to run out there for field goal. I have no idea what's going on. My mind is racing, but just the excitement from that and being able to see it was, was so good and being able to play in that game and be a part of that was just an amazing experience. Yeah, because I was gonna ask, like, yeah, that the when the zero 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 and the final score twenty three twenty one, like what was happening after that? What did y'all do? How did y'all celebrate? Cause like that's that's a crazy feeling to win a national championship. I I, I assume so. Like what did y'all do after that? Yeah, so I, I remember when the clock hit zero, they had they had a couple plays left and they were kind of doing some flim flams, throwing the ball around, trying to get it out into the end zone. And the tackle, the guy makes the tackle, and I hear one of our coaches scream yes, and I can't see it. But then everyone starts running on the field. So I start running, and it's uh, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it right now. I'm just running blind on the field, trying to grab as many people as I can and hug them. The confetti starts raining down. It's, It's a moment I'll never forget. It's probably my greatest moment to this day. And just being able to run out there with all the guys through COVID, through bringing the, the pads in our in our lockers or in our cars, doing laundry at home, having to do group laundry, just all that stuff comes back. And to be able to have it pay off was so good. And then getting to do the trophy ceremony, you know, we lift up the trophy. I was in the way back because I was just looking it all in, seeing the confetti fall, seeing our coach lift the trophy. It was such a cool experience. And then on top of that, you know, we only live, you know, about two hours from Frisco. So the game ends in the afternoon. So we get home. We have plenty of time. So Huntsville shuts down at that point. Everyone's celebrating. You know, we go out to our, our local bar, the Jolly Fox, and the the tab was paid for. So, you know, it was free drinks all night. And then we all we all were given cowboy hats, uh, the national championships, because not every team's from Texas. They give both teams cowboy hats because, you know, welcome to Texas this is a national championship. So we all have our cowboy hats on. We're walking around. Everyone's congratulating us we're getting free drinks from everybody we get to do our chant you know the dj shouts us out and it was just such a great celebration and and to be able to be close to home where we can get home at time and and have time to be around our friends and family it was it was awesome and like i said those are those are the memories you'll never forget not game five where you lost by five points but getting to celebrate at the bar with all your teammates and all all the local huntsville people and your family and your friends that's what you're gonna remember, man. That is that is so dope. Yeah, I, I can only imagine the amount of like the pandemonium. I feel like if COVID didn't have, if COVID wasn't happening, then I definitely I think it would have been a bigger like it'd been a parade in Huntsville. I think it would have been because I definitely would have drove and saw it. But you know, obviously we were during COVID, so you have this peak, right? This is an amazing moment, and then you transition to go and doing coaching. I'm just curious what what uh pushed that transition into coaching. Yeah. So, you know, I, because of COVID, I got an extra year. And so the, my sixth year I spent at the university of incarnate word, um, you know, Sam Houston transitioned to FBS and kind of looking in the mirror again, whether, you know, going to the NFL or being an FBS tight end, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to make it. I, I, this conversation you have to have with your coaches. And, and I had that great conversation with coach Merkins and, we had a great, honest conversation. It was like, look, you just don't fit the bill and you can stay, but you're probably not going to play a lot. And I understood that. And so I transferred the University of Incarnate Word in San Antonio. And I had a great year up there, spent so much, have made so many friends, had great memories up in San Antonio. And at that time, you know, I, I was kind of getting towards the end of my career and I knew that this was my last year and I had to figure out what was the next step. And I didn't think I was ever going to get into coaching. It was something that my mom always said I was going to do, and I always fought it. Uh, I got my degree in film, and I'm working on my master's in mass communication. So I always thought I was going to go down the broadcasting or cinematography route. But just kind of working working with the younger tight ends and, and going to camps, you know, helping with the Sam Houston camp in the summer and helping the Incarnate Word camp. I just kind of fell in love with it. I fell in love with the process and and being around Coach Darlington, who I talked about earlier, who really got me into coaching and really kind of showed me the ropes. It was something I enjoyed doing. I enjoy recruiting. That's that's another side of the business that 
a lot of people don't see. And I, I love the side of recruiting and, and doing that process. So when it came time, when my career ended, I spent a semester at Sam Houston as an offensive line GA, just kind of learning the ropes and getting the beginning of it. And then when that ended up going through, I was looking for a job. And, you know, thankfully, Coach Alex Rainwater, our offensive coordinator here at Southeastern, hit me up, their tight end coach. He left kind of last minute and they needed somebody. And I knew him through the transfer portal. So we had a relationship there. He hit me up and said, hey, you want to do this? And I, I said, I'm all in, just like walk-on opportunity. This is a great opportunity. And so now I'm here, first year coaching, just kind of learning the, the, the ins and outs of it. And, you know, we're going to make mistakes and we're going to figure them out. But I'm having a blast. And, you know, my mom was right. She got me. Uh, the coaching <laughs> bug is, has hit me hard. Yeah, mom was always right, man. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, describe to us, like, what have you learned about yourself so far being while being a coach? Like, is there anything new that you learned about yourself while being a coach? Well, I think the thing that I've learned is I see myself in these players. And I think that's what it goes back to being a coach that has played before. I understand what these guys are going through. And I understand the process of how hard it is. And and some days are going to be harder than others. Some days you're just not feeling it. Some days you're having a bad day. And I can relate to that. And I think it's something that I, I can understand. I've learned about myself that, like, you know, some days you wake up and, man, I don't want to go to practice. I don't want to coach today. I just want to kind of lay in bed. But you just got to go through it. And, and being there for the guys makes my day. Having, having practice, we have practice at 3 o'clock. From 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock is my favorite time of the day because I get to be with my guys and with my players and just be around them, be around the game still, and and seeing these guys that are still enjoying college. It's something that I, I'll always love college football and love the college experience and getting to see my guys doing that and, and enjoying it and, and having the highs of a win and the lows of a loss. It's something that I love, and I've learned a lot about myself and, and who I am as a person and – just being around the guys has made everything so much easier. You know, I live in Durant, Oklahoma, where our school's at, and there's not a lot to do here. And so just being around the guys just makes my day and getting to, getting to understand these guys. And when they have issues, I can be there for them. And on top of that, recruiting. Now I get to be in what I was in my high school shoes, where these good young athletes, they just want a chance. And I can give these guys a chance and giving these athletes offers to come play for my school. It's just such a gratifying feeling for me because I was in those shoes of, man, I don't know if I'm going to get a chance to play and having a coach believe in me and trust in my film. And so getting to do that has just been such an honor. And I'm so grateful for Coach Rainwater and Coach Atterbury, our head coach, for giving me this chance because, you know, it's it's been so much fun. And, and the experience I'm getting here is, is stuff that I can take with me for a long time. Gotcha. So from that, do you have an end goal? So do you feel like you could be one day a head coach in college or a head coach, maybe if you go or go to the NFL level, be a tight end coach in NFL? Like, what, what do, you, do you feel like you can rank up like that? Yeah, I think eventually, you know, I'm, I'm only 25 or 24, excuse me. So I, I have a lot of time to grow and a lot of time to develop. Uh, eventually, I want to be on the FBS level. I don't think I have NFL aspirations. That could change. Uh, I love college football. I love recruiting, and that's where I want to stay. Um, in terms of position, I'm not sure. I I love coaching tight ends. It's what I played. It's what I know. Uh, I think if I was going to play another or coach another position, it'd probably be offensive line. Um, right now, I don't have any aspirations to be an offensive coordinator, but that could change the more experience I get and, and the more time I spend in the coaching world. But I think eventually I would want to be a head coach. I think it's something that is everyone's end goal, just like going to the NFL, being a head coach someday. Uh, I would love to do that. I would love to be a recruiting coordinator, just kind of running the recruiting operation. So I have, to, you know, it, it's it's going to change as I grow older and the more I learn and the more I develop. But I'm good. If I stay a tight ends coach the rest of my life, I'm, I'm okay. Now, what level? You know, eventually my, my school before Sam Houston was University of Texas. So if I ever had to say one school I would love to coach at, it'd probably be Texas. But if I stay a tight ends coach my whole career, I'm totally okay with that. 
I love to hear that. That's that, that means you really love that. You really love the position. You really love um, helping young tight ends. That's really that's really dope to hear. Um, so from that, I did want to pivot a little bit, and I know you have a podcast, Walk On Radio. It, I'm just curious what what started that. So what started your interest? You said you also had a mass comm experience and all in college. Like what started or what you know made you interested in doing that? Yeah, so when I was in the MassCom program, the really cool thing about Sam Houston MassCom program is you kind of do everything. So I was a film major. That was my emphasis was film, but we still had to take radio class. We had to do a podcasting class, editing, writing, directing. And so we did kind of everything. And one of my classes my sophomore year was a radio class where I had to run the radio station, the Sam Houston radio station. And I loved it. I had so much fun with it. And during COVID, during that run, media wasn't allowed to be at the practices or the game because of COVID. They weren't allowed to cover the game. They had to do it from afar. And so me and one of my great friends, Ryan Humphrey, you know, I kind of threw it up to him. I said, hey, what if we start a sports podcast? Because he knows everything about football. He is a football genius. He watches NFL religiously. He knows everything about the game. I could ask him a question. He would know it. And so I brought it up to him like, hey, what if we did this sports podcast? And he said, let's do it. And I was kind of joking about it. I was halfway serious, but he pushed me to do it. He said, let's do it. It would be great. And so we started Walk On Radio, and it just happened to be the year that we won the national championship. It, it really timed up perfectly where we're covering each game. And we're like, hey, man, you know, we might lose this next game, but we're, we're having fun doing our radio. And it was like, whoa, we're winning the next one. And as we go on, we get in the playoffs. We're like, hey, we don't know what's going to happen here, but we have a chance. And to be able to win the national championship the year we started to walk on radio was just really cool timing. And we had so much fun doing it. We got on the news. We had some great guests come on. We had some FCS insiders join us. And I just had so much fun doing it. And it's something that I could put on my resume. It was That's a big thing, too, is, yeah, it's fun to do, but it's also something that I can take with me for a long time. Wow. That's uh, can you tell me um, who's like the, I guess the most or the biggest guest that you had on the walk on radio, anyone that you definitely. (coughs) I'm with. Yeah. So we had, uh, we had the McCollum twins who are now Zion McCollum is a starting corner for the Tampa Bay bucks. And Tristan McCollum plays for the Philadelphia Eagles. So those were two big-time guests. Uh, we had Timothy Flanders. Uh, Sam Houston, people know him. He he was a Flanders flip during the Piney Woods game where he had a famous flip. He was a, He's Sam Houston's all-time leading rusher. Uh, and then we had a few FCS insiders that would join us to kind of talk the playoffs. And so those were our big ones. Uh, but the McCollum twins, especially what they're doing now, those were our guys that, you know, at the end of nowadays, you look at it, it's like, wow, those were cool guests to have. Now they're both starting. And Zion is the highest rated PFF corner right now uh, in mm. the NFL. So that's a that's a really cool that in when he was young, he was on our podcast. Wow, that's that's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing, man. Those are some dope guests. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to uh, speaking of the NFL and just want to ask, you know, I guess last bit of questions here. I know you're a Green Bay Packer fan. And, you know, I just want to get that in, you know, like what is your what are your thoughts so far on the Green Bay Packers season? You know, it's been tough because I was a diehard Rodgers fan and we're, we're now in the love era. And I was skeptical at first, you know, watching his college tape. Jordan Love was pretty iffy. He was he was OK. And I was worried that he might not be our franchise quarterback because we've gone through some great quarterbacks. You know, we went through far straight to Rodgers and now we're at love. And, you know, we of course, we started with Bart Starr. So we've had a great list of quarterbacks. And so when Jordan Love start, first started playing that first year, he impressed me. And we we went a lot farther than I thought we would. Uh, this year, I'm really excited. I think they're doing good things. The, you know, there's a whole issue with Romeo Dubes uh, right now where he's not getting touches and, and he's been having some issues. But I think we're good with Christian Watson. You know, we still have Josh Jacobs, which we got over the offseason, which I think is a great pickup. Given that we're a run first team, it really seems like I know AJ Dillon's he's out with an injury, but we got guys. We our defense is great, Jair Alexander, and uh I think we're doing a lot of great things. Kenny Clark in the front. 
I think, you know, I don't know if this is the team. And, you know, I said that, and, and it could be, but I think we're, we're creating a good space to compete. Now, the NFC is a tough, tough conference right now, or division. There's so many playmakers, so many good teams right now. And so we're, we're kind of in the middle of the pack right now. But I think, you know, if we can pull it all together, we still, we have a chance in the playoffs. Yeah, man. I hope you, if you face Dallas again, I hope you give them a beating like you did last time because yeah, they can't, <laughs> <laughs> they definitely can't get over that. Yeah. Green Bay, man. They all are really solid team. Love, like you said, he looked really impressive. I feel like in the beginning of the season last year, a lot of people were coming at him because he wasn't, there was some games he wasn't playing as well. But I was like, yeah, you got to give him some time. You know, he's t- kind of a rookie in a way because, yeah. You know, I, I was one of those people. I was, I was mm-hmm. on the hater train <laughs> and then he started winning and I was like, oh, I've always been a fan of Jordan Love. I was one of those guys, but. <laughs> I'm glad he's playing well, and you can tell that he's learned a lot from Rodgers. They have a lot of similarities, and so, yeah. you know, I'm glad it's working out. Yeah, and you guys, you play Houston. I'm, I'm a Texan fan. Y'all play Houston in, in two weeks, I believe, two, three, week, three weeks from now. So that's, that'll be that'll be fun. That'll be stressful, I think. That'll be a hard game in Green Bay, but obviously I'm not going to be rooting for you in that game. But, you know. Dude, I'll tell you, it's a good time to be a Texans fan. I mean, y'all, y'all have waited a long time for this, and it's finally – it's finally starting to piece together. I think the Texans, they got a chance. I think they can make a run. Uh, C.J. Stroud has been doing some crazy things, and a D'Amico Ryan's their head coach. I, it, it's it's really cool to see, just like talking about Texas State with a team that has, hasn't been good for a long time. And the Texans have always been very middle of the pack, make the playoff, lose the first round. But to see them actually be a Super Bowl contender, and, you know, being a guy that lived in Houston, I, I have no choice. When uh, we, we had basic cable on television, so I only got to watch Texans games. And so I ended up becoming a low-key Texans fan. So it, it's really cool to see the success that they're having now. Hey, let's only hope we play each other in the Super Bowl. But I'm telling you, the Chiefs, they in the way. And Ravens are good, too. They, they also in the way. But the Chiefs, that 3 P you got to you gotta try to stop it in any way possible. So oh, yeah. we'll, we'll see what we can do. We'll see what we can do. And hopefully y'all, y'all make a – you know, your division is pretty tough, but – I think y'all can make a run. I think the Vikings will probably kind of stop being impossible to beat. If unstoppable. Man, and what a story with that, too. <laughs> Sam Darnold coming in and all of a sudden being a franchise quarterback. The Vikings have been doing some crazy yeah. stuff. Yeah, I know. They I faced them, and it was not fun. They blew us down. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect that, but it is just is what it is. But I didn't want to say, man, thank you so much for coming on here. I learned a lot about you, and I learned a lot about your story. It's really dope. Um, that Sam Houston State team, that championship is the only time I've seen, well, not the only time I've ever seen a championship, but a college championship, and that gave me some really good pride. So just hearing from an athlete who went to Sam Houston, went through that, also doing podcasts or, you know, does podcast stuff and was doing it at the same time as your run to the national championship. I mean, that's 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 beautiful. You write that in a book and, you know, publish it, but that's a beautiful story to tell. So <laughs> and it's, it's been a pleasure talking to you, man. Is there anything you want to plug or at the end here? Anything you want to like you walk on radio or anything? Yeah. So I just right now, man, you know, shout out my team, the Southeastern Oklahoma Savage Storm. We're two and three right now. We got a we got a couple tough games ahead of us, but excited to keep working. Uh you can you can follow me on Twitter, Daltonmeyer85. I post a lot of coaching stuff on there. I gotta keep it professional. Uh, but I I I love being on Twitter. I love interacting with people and you know, just excited to keep going with this season, and you know, we'll see where we end up at the end of the day. But loving what I'm doing, and excited to keep rolling. Yeah, and if you're ever available, man, the Sports Factory podcast, we would love to have you on and talk, especially talk trash to the Cowboys. Cowboys <laughs> on there. But it was a pleasure having you on here, man. And if you're on here, if you're watching this far, make sure to like this video, make sure to subscribe to the channel for more interviews. And I'll catch you on the next video. We're out of here. Peace.